Prime Minister is spending a second night in intensive care being treated for coronavirus. But Downing Street said today he was in good spirits, having been admitted to hospital originally on Sunday evening. Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, who is deputising for the Prime Minister, said Mr Johnson is in a stable condition. He's been given oxygen, but he's not on a ventilator. The Queen has sent a message of support to Mr Johnson's family, including his partner, Carrie Simons, who's expecting their child. Now, the latest official figures on the spread of coronavirus show that 786 have died in hospital. That is the highest reported so far for a 24-hour period. But experts do say that the growth in numbers is actually lower than the predicted long-term trend. And it brings the total number of deaths in UK hospitals to more than 6,000. The government admitted today that the UK could indeed learn lessons from Germany on testing and on finding a way out of the crisis. Well, first, let's join our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, at Westminster. Well, Hugh, when we talked this time last night, there was a real sense of shock here in Westminster and I'm sure around the country too. It was only a couple of hours that we'd, since we'd learnt that the Prime Minister had been moved to intensive care, struggling with the symptoms of coronavirus. Now, he's still in intensive care tonight, but I think it's important to note and to say that his symptoms have not been getting worse. It seems he has not been deteriorating while in hospital. The government, that said, is insisting that business is going on as much as usual as possibly can be. The government machine is still whirring and ticking away. But still there are questions about exactly how they are managing with the leader absent. It is still a time of profound political and practical pressure. Nothing stops the spring, but the country's on pause. Not knowing how deep this crisis will really cut, if the Prime Minister himself will recover. After a night for Boris Johnson in intensive care, the Foreign Secretary in his place at the lectern. He remains stable overnight. He's receiving standard oxygen treatment and breathing without any assistance. He's not required any mechanical ventilation or non-invasive respiratory support. He's not just the Prime Minister. For all of us in Cabinet, he's not just our boss. He's also a colleague and he's also our friend. So all of our thoughts and prayers are with the Prime Minister at this time, with Carrie and with his whole family. And I'm confident he'll pull through. Because if there's one thing I know about this Prime Minister, he's a fighter. Politicians in other parts of the globe have been laid low. But Boris Johnson's the only world leader needing this kind of emergency care. Stable for now, but in a fast-moving situation. Hi, folks. Quick update for me on... The, the last public glimpse of the Prime Minister was on Friday. My own case, uh, although I'm feeling better and I've done my... Obviously own. ill, speaking from his flat. Admitted to hospital on Sunday, then into intensive care last night. Behind Whitehall's closed doors and empty spaces, the government's machine still whirs. Specific cabinet committees are grappling with different challenges from the crisis. The civil service continues, whatever happens, but many dilemmas are ahead. With the Prime Minister absent, at this vital time, if there is a genuine disagreement in the Cabinet, who actually makes the decision? Decision-making by government is made by collective Cabinet responsibility, so that is the same um, as before. But we've got very clear directions, very clear instructions from the Prime Minister, and we're focused uh, with total unity and total resolve on implementing them. Of course, any Prime Minister is actually the ultimate decision-maker. Good morning, everybody. It's great to, to see you all here. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, on Mr Johnson's left, would take the Foreign Secretary's place if he fell ill. Michael Gove, on Dominic Raab's right, the latest, along with many Downing Street staff stuck in isolation at home. But a rare appearance from the former boss of this table sought to reassure. The infrastructure is there day by day. Uh, it's the infrastructure of the civil service, it's the infrastructure of a cabinet, of ministers and junior, and then of course junior ministers. Uh, and there is always somebody who, if the prime minister isn't available, is able to step into that place and lead that cabinet government. Normal politics on hold. Our thoughts are with the prime minister, his fiance and his family. The Labour Party will act in the national interest. And that's why I've offered to act constructively with the government and support them where that's the right thing to do and push them further where we need to do it. I want to send every good wish to him, to his fiancée and to his whole family. 
We are all willing you on, Boris. Get well soon. A stressful and strange moment of history. An impromptu poster taped to Mr Johnson's own hero. Get well messages from the ward and from Windsor. The Queen sending her own message of support to the Prime Minister's family and his fiancée, expecting her first child. Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, politician, a partner and a father too. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News. Well, patients suffering the worst effects of coronavirus often need admission to intensive care as the disease attacks the lungs and a ventilator is needed to take over the patient's breathing. Downing Street said today that the Prime Minister was being given oxygen but had not been placed uh, on a ventilator. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, looks at what kind of treatment a patient can expect when they are admitted into intensive care. There for the sickest patients. Intensive care units in hospitals have sophisticated monitoring equipment and highly trained staff who are constantly checking those in their care. Patients will normally require an oxygen supply, sometimes with devices like this known as CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. So there could be patients there who are simply on oxygen. Um, beyond that, we sometimes uh, buy a tight fitting pressure mask, which if you're wearing it, feels a little bit like putting your head out of a moving car window. There's a additional pressure to help keep your lungs inflated and help with your work of breathing. If their condition worsens, some patients will be put on a mechanical ventilator to help them breathe. This involves a tube inserted into the airway and the patient will be sedated. Rhea was in hospital for an operation and then was diagnosed with COVID-19. She describes what it was like to be an intensive care patient. There was a, there was a point where um, I wasn't sure if I would come out of the hospital. That was the truth. Sorry. It was very hard because I didn't even have the breath to ask the questions. The nurses, the doctors were by my side. They thought of everything I needed before even I could think of it. I, I, I owe them my life. My situation started to worsen again. Fez from Bradford was another coronavirus patient who was moved to an intensive care unit and stayed there for five days. The first thing was all the wires coming out on me. That was so scary. Uh, and having uh, this mask put onto me, uh, for about 12 hours, I think it was. Uh, that was really scary. Um, and it was also really weird. Uh, each time I'd call for a nurse or a nurse would want to uh, come into the room, they have to put all this protective gear on, which would sometimes take 15 to 20 minutes to put on. Um, uh, but they were fantastic. The latest survey showed that the average age was 60 for COVID patients in intensive care, 73% are men and 27% are women. Those with a BMI over 25, defined as overweight or obese, made up 73% of the patients. And those who had to be put on a ventilator within the first 24 hours accounted for 63%. Coronavirus patients who are still very unwell after two weeks are most likely to need intensive care, and that will require at least a week in hospital. Dr Ron Daniels, who heads the Sepsis Trust, is a critical care consultant. He says it can take a long time to make a full recovery. For those who've been critically unwell enough to need to be on a ventilator, particularly if it's for more than a few days, which is the majority of patients, we shouldn't expect to see them return to their full level of function for several months after the illness. This is really going to hit people hard. It all depends. Patient experiences in intensive care vary a lot, but they're all there because they're seriously ill. Hugh Pym, BBC News.